scientific literature review. Kelly and Roberto. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you, sure. Suzanne. So that yeah, you're so I'll okay. run around. Will be my exercise for the day. <laughs> well, Suzanne, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. We weren't sure if we were going to have an introduction, so we uh, we ha have a little slide here. But before I, I move on, I wanted to say that I've been very fortunate over the 11 years that I've been a faculty member to have three graduate students that have been really interested in in teaching. At Purdue, I only had a 10% teaching appointment, and here at, at Michigan State, I have a 30%. So obviously, I'm I'm teaching a lot more. But these graduate students have really kind of pushed me to even get uh, involved more um, in other aspects of teaching, as, as I'm going to show you. Um, one of them is now uh, a prof assistant professor at Iowa State, and the other just started at Colorado State, with both with uh, heavy teaching appointments. And, and we hope that Kelly will join their, their footsteps. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. So just uh, obviously, uh, Suzanne talked about my uh, career. but. I have uh, two young children and, and my wife, and we like to uh, go to national parks. That's one of our, our favorite things to do. And obviously, I'm in horticulture, so I'm, I'm teaching my little one at a young age to uh, have an interest in lump and plant. She, she helps me garden quite a bit. Um, and I am from Iowa, um, a small town, Guttenberg, Iowa. And I went to Iowa State uh, for my, my bachelor's and master's. And my master's advisor was actually Roberto's first PhD student. So it's kind of funny how you, know, you get in your academic discipline and you're very um, inbred. Um, but he was very interested in teaching as well. Um, so when I was a graduate student there, I was very, he um, let me be very involved um, in teaching and helping um, steer his courses. Um, so uh, implementing primary literature review um, in the classroom, the first thing we'd like to do is ask you guys a few questions. Or, well, we'll talk about why. Well, first, why, uh, why we did this, uh, how we got to doing this project that we'll be explaining. Um, then we'll go on to how. Like, how did we implement it? How did you, how should, can you implement um, a literature review project in your classroom, um, not just any type of literature review, uh, but really how to improve critical thinking um, and increase the uh, work that your students are doing, or not increase the work, but increase what, what they're thinking. And then uh, what? So what did we do with our research project and how effective it was? So this is kind of the overview of our talk today. And before actually we move on, I wanted to ask, I know that this is, um, workshop is for STEM faculty. So how many of you are in the College of uh, Natural Science? OK. How many in College of Agriculture? And Natural Resource. And Natural Resource, thank you. Uh, <laughs> physical Sciences? Engineering? Math? OK. So about half and half with Natural and Ag, so good. So basically, what I wanted to first uh, start off and kind of show you, I wanted to basically give you some examples of not only what we're going to talk about today, but some of the work uh, that I was involved in at, at Purdue in terms of the scholarship of teaching and learning. So as, as you're all aware, we're, we're in, in horticulture. And as Suzanne indicated, I've taught courses primarily related to greenhouse production, so production of, of plants indoors. And Oftentimes, um, we hear from our clientele that our students aren't necessarily prepared when they go into the workforce with hands-on experiences, even though they're required to do internships. And so one thing that we wanted to do is, is basically train the students on how to grow a crop by themselves and make decisions on their own so that when they go into the industry, they have some experience, as well as being able to educate others. So, there's something called total crop management. It's basically um, an integration of various steps of basically growing a, a crop. Um, and it had been used at Clemson University to train graduate students that were uh, interested in going into extension. So basically um, educating growers. So what we did is we developed a one credit uh, lab both at Purdue as well as at Iowa State with my uh, former graduate student. It's called uh, total crop management. 
So basically in this um, one hour, one and a half hour uh, lab, basic, uh, students would collect data. They would go through the crop, they would measure uh, the height. They were basically growing a poinsettia crop, which is probably one of the most challenging greenhouse crops to grow. Um, they would collect pH and EC, they would look for pests. Um, I'll, I'll show you some photos of, of what they were doing. And then we would come back to the lab and discuss what they found. They would basically plot their data. We would discuss uh, you know, what they saw. And I would, I would act as their consultant. So I would kind of try to steer them in the right direction. Then it was basically team-based decision making on did they have to apply a plant growth regulator? Did someone have to apply a pesticide? Um, was their height getting uh, on their crop too tall? Did we have to adjust the temperature or the light? So basically, again, it was a weekly decision-making and management approach. And I was uh, you know, pretty excited teaching this course because you know, it, was, it was relatively small, about 12 students. And the students were um, very dedicated, also wanted to make sure that they were going to produce a, a high-quality crop because they were actually going to get to sell the crop at the end. So they, bit, they looked at uh, pest and disease, plant growth, uh, looked at medium water quality, and uh, measured weekly temperature and light data. So this is some of the data that they collected. So they would make decisions on what they had to do to adjust the pH and EC of their crop. They made decisions on when we had to apply a plant growth regulator. So this is basically the, the height of what the crop uh, needed to be. So the, um, a lot of the retail stores won't accept a poinsettia crop if it's too tall or too short. So you can see that they did a nice job with their crop at the end. It basically was right in the middle. So one way to um, basically assess how well this total crop management um, course was going is we, had, we did a pre and a post uh, student self-assessment. And obviously we had to get uh, IRB or Institutional Review, Review Board approval to do uh, testing on human subjects. So that's something that if you're interested in, in doing some of this, make sure that you go through uh, the IRB process. It's, it's actually relatively um, easy. Um, so these are, are the different things that we asked them right prior to beginning the course. We asked them uh, their understanding of total crop management, how to implement some of the concepts, um, if they had any idea of how to control plant height, um, et cetera. So um, some of the interesting things that we found is at the beginning, um, most students indicated that they had some understanding of uh, the various concepts that we were going to cover in the course. But it was nice to see that at the end, except for substrate and water, water quality, um, that, that they did uh, learn some of the aspects. They felt much more confident in being able to um, interpret data as well as to um, suggest uh, to a fellow, let's say they, they had a position in a greenhouse, um, what, what they needed to do. So we basically found that the use of total crop management increased student confidence. And that's one of the things that Kelly and I are going to talk about today is, is trying to increase student confidence through other aspects and that, that we uh, traditionally use in the classroom. So um, again, total crop management uh, increased the understanding and principles um, and strategies involved in, in total crop. So we. Uh, published a paper last year. If you want to read more information, it's in Hort Technology of how we implemented this uh, particular uh, new strategy for undergraduate students. So moving on to um, what we're talking about today. So Roberto has taught um, you know, various floriculture uh, crop production courses for about 11 years now. Yes. And um, he's done a lot of primary literature review and I think that's a pretty um, common um, activity that's done in, in science courses and um, last year I was a fast fellow and I was thinking okay if we have a lecture course so uh, for example his greenhouse structures and management course does not have a lab to it and you'd think with a, with a course like that a lab would be very beneficial but how can we um, encourage more critical thinking um, in a lab-based, or not a lab-based, a non-lab-based setting in a lecture course. Um, and so we looked at what he, I looked at our, what he already had um, in his uh, syllabus. So he had some primary literature review. 
and um, that's kind of how this project came to be. So how can we increase critical thinking um, with, with um, primary literature? So, so we've basically, um, I've incorporated primary literature into 200, 300, and 400 level uh, courses. And sometimes I'll, I'll have students in terms of uh, the SIRS or um, uh, evaluations indicate that, uh, I'd say the vast majority enjoy it. There's, there are a few students that'll indicate that uh, they think this isn't a writing course, this is a, a horticulture class. Why are you making us write about uh, scientific literature or I'm not gonna become a graduate student. But I think the, the vast majority of the students really do enjoy reading papers that are related to topics that you're covering in the course. Yeah, so um, this past spring, Roberto was teaching a course that he hadn't taught before, uh, floriculture production. So he said, you can do whatever you want. Uh, so we, um, we, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it more in depth, but uh, we ended up implementing a series of five primary research um, article reviews. Um, One thing, Kelly mentioned that she was a oh. fast fallow. Does everyone know what a fast fallow is? No, Ke Kelly, do you wanna? So for those of you who don't know, um, it's future academic, I don't remember what it stands for. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, so I want to be a faculty member someday. And we're so focused on our, our scientific research, I'm always in the greenhouse or in the lab working, um, that I really wanted to improve my uh, teaching and to, to learn how to do teaching research. So it's a, it's a group of PhD students um, that are interested in science and STEM that are interested in teaching. So, yeah, with that, uh, we have a few questions because we want to know what you guys have been doing in your classroom. Uh, what do you teach? What courses are you teaching? Organismal population biology. Organismal population biology. What? Human dimensions of fisheries and wildlife. Fisheries and wildlife? Okay. General chemistry. Chemistry. Okay. I could use a chemistry review. <laughs> <laughs> what else are you guys teaching? Biology, fisheries and wildlife, chemistry. Neuroscience. Neuroscience. Okay. So we have a pretty broad um, variety of disciplines. Um, how many of you, uh, by show of hands, currently use primary literature in your course? So maybe about half. Um, well, we'll be going over, um, if you don't currently um, have primary literature, we'll be going over some steps on what we think, um, how to implement primary literature. And then for those of you who already uh, have a primary literature uh, project in your course, maybe how to beef that up a little bit and improve critical thinking. Um, so why do you, you, why use primary literature? Why do you have it in your course? How to read graphs. That's, that's important. That's something that's lacking sometimes. <laughs> Any other reason? I want students to understand what's currently um, being done in the field. So current information, yep. just keeping up with what's going on right now. Yeah. Um, I like doing popular versus primary literature. So popular. Kind of mm -hmm. Secondary. What, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. primary versus secondary literature. Yep. And that's something that we've been talking about in our course as well. Yeah. And one thing that I also like to, um, I think is important, is that oftentimes students don't necessarily understand what we do beyond teaching. Or if they do, uh, you know, they obviously they, they know that we do research, they sometimes think that their tuition dollars uh, basically fund our research. I think it's a, a common misconception with, with undergrads. So that's something that I try to do when, when I give a lecture. I basically have a lecture on primary and secondary literature, which I'll, I'll be doing on Thursday, to get them to understand you know, the whole scientific process and why we conduct research in, in universities and how that is applicable to what they're going into. So lastly, okay, what you're, you're implementing primary literature. What level of Bloom's taxonomy does your activity fit into? Does anybody want to jump in on this one? So are you teaching mainly for content knowledge? A lot of remembering, um, maybe trying to get them to understand some of the concepts. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more and how, yeah. So I, I use it for some critical evaluation. Okay. Uh, but also as a, as a starting point uh, for philosophical 
philosophical discussion. Okay. Um, the, I teach a course at Zoo Animal Biology and Conservation, and so it deals with, I deal with some ethical issues of, okay, this is happening, what do you think about this? Right, like we, we medicate many of our primates now to keep their stress levels and anxiety levels down with SSRIs like we give to humans. What do you think about this? Do you think it's a good idea? See, that's a great, so, sorry, I should have ran this over to you, but um, I'll just repeat a little bit of that for the, the microphone thing. Um, so using primary literature as a springboard for classroom discussions, so that's a great way to increase, um, you know, increase critical thinking. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit of that here, too, because that's some of what, what we were doing. But that's a great way to use uh, primary literature. So I was thinking, like, why, why we started implementing it. So like you said, a source of, of new technology and methods. Where else can you find the newest methods besides in research papers like this? Um, and then student learning outcomes. So you know, we say the student, we want our students to know this or this. Or, so we can use primary literature to um, pull out some of those ideas and reinforce them in our classroom. And I think, I mean, those of you that are in the College of Ag are, are probably aware that the college <coughs> is looking at uh, student, student learning outcomes. Um, our department has 12 uh, learning outcomes that we basically have for our uh, students. And so when Kelly came to me, it was, it was actually kind of great because one of our learning outcomes was, great, uh, was basically aligned with students um, looking at both current and older uh, literature. And, and how to interpret that literature. So I was. So <clears throat> Bloom's taxonomy. We have our our paper that we want them to review and summarize. Um, a lot of times we focus on remembering or maybe understanding. So they summarize the paper. They go through and say, okay, this was, these were the treatments. This was the objective, um, and this is what happened. But sometimes we don't go beyond that. And again, through this project, we want to. Um, kind of move up on this pyramid um, to create. We want students to create, um, <clears throat> not only to analyze the paper, but to create recommendations. So we're focusing on creating recommendations for our audience, which is a greenhouse grower. So basically for them to create their own secondary literature, maybe not necessarily in the written form, but in, so that they can communicate that. So. We were thinking about this, and there's a few steps that we thought uh, were integral to implementing primary literature in a meaningful way. Um, first, course alignment, and we'll go through all of these in more detail, um, but does this project align with your course, and how can it fit in? Second, manuscript identification, and this is very important, um, making sure the manuscript that you select uh, complements your class well and complements the ideas that you're trying to portray. Uh, third, your audience. Your audience is not only your students, but um, what are your students going to do after they graduate? Are they, um, for our case, a lot of ours are going to be greenhouse growers. Um, so can they pr portray some of the ideas to a greenhouse grower? <laughs> or if they're going to be a graduate student or uh, whatever area they're going to be. Um, and then teaching article analysis. So uh, the students may say, oh yeah, I know how to summarize an article. Um, but do they really know how to do that effectively? Um, so really how to teach them how to do this and walk them uh, through the steps. And then student learning or content knowledge. So in our courses, we want the students to learn things. Like we, we want them um, to learn that, oh yeah, we do often sedate, uh, sedate animals in a zoo, um, and this is why. But we also want them to think about it a bit, right? And so our focus was on creating recommendations or giving them the, um, the information that they need and the ability to think about whatever issue was in the paper um, to provide recommendations to our audience. And then follow up. So um, I know everybody's really busy. And a lot of times it's like, okay, I need to get this done, check the box, um, and then there's not a lot of follow-up. So making sure we follow up um, with our activities um, to make sure the students actually um, got what they should out of it. So first, uh, course alignment. 
Um, do you want to talk about this, Roberto? Sure. So yeah, in terms of um, having course objectives and learning outcomes, so in, in my syllabi, I, I basically put out what the learning um, objectives are for the course and what do I expect the students to have gained once they have completed my course, um, as, as well as uh, having what the departmental learning outcomes are, so how those align. And sometimes, you know, I, I don't think most students really pay attention. But I think it's, it's important to, to lay out, you know, this is what I want you to learn. This is what you're going to learn. Um, so here's an example of um, one of the um, out, or, yeah, learning outcomes. Basically, I want the students to be able to synthesize and critique primary and secondary literature to make greenhouse crop rec recommendations. So um, that's for um, the greenhouse structures and management class. And then for the... Um, uh, production course, I basically want them to be able to critically analyze a commercial greenhouse. So actually I got those wrong. This is for the, um, this is for the production course and this is for the structures course. So we, we do a field trip, a, a mandatory field trip where the students go to a commercial greenhouse and what I do is basically have them critically analyze the greenhouse from what we've learned. So what are some of the mistakes that they may have made when they constructed this greenhouse? And they actually talk to the greenhouse grower and, and tell them that. And sometimes the grower is like, wow, I never even thought about, you know, that I have this huge gap where basically dollar bills are, are going out. And so um, I think that really helps the students to um, not only, you know, take in the material, but also be able to, to communicate. So. Another thing we wanted to point out were these two um, course objectives. So this one clearly states, okay, I want you to be able to read this primary literature and analyze it. And this other one is not saying, okay, this, maybe this doesn't pertain to primary literature, but you can look in your, in your um, course objective and say, okay, there is this manuscript about um, greenhouse, the glazing material. And maybe if you have this type of glazing material, it's better than this type, and this is why. And so that will help facilitate their critical analysis of a commercial greenhouse. Um, so whether you explicitly say, um, we want you to be able to you know, critically analyze primary literature, or if you're implementing this um, to support a different objective, um, it can be implemented many different ways. So, and Roberto kind of touched on this, departmental learning outcomes, and that's something that our department just started doing a couple years ago, and um, I was the faculty representative uh, for our graduate organization, so I was going to the meetings, and some of the professors were like, oh, um, I can, I'm choosing how I'm, you know, measuring the departmental learning outcomes so I can just change those and the, the you know, the measurements increase, our scores increase, um, but there's a survey of the students at the end, and if the students are saying, oh, I don't really know how to do this very well, um, then that's something we should address. And how do we address um, issues with learning outcomes? Um, we're all scientists, right? So we can use a scientific method. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing here in testing some of the ideas that we have. Um, but you can treat your different learning outcomes as a science experiment, trying to implement new ways and really testing that to see if it's effective. So, so basically what we're doing is not only do we have the learning outcomes, but we also within the department are assessing, uh, making sure that our students are actually at the end of the course, um, they're, they're, uh, they mastered the particular learning outcome. So in our department we have about, we want 80% of our students to master the, that particular learning outcome. So um, we have various methods of, of basically looking at that. So for us, we basically looked at uh, the summary that they write for their primary literature review uh, for this particular learning outcome. So if this is one, using multiple sources, <coughs> including current and older literature, to find, evaluate, organize, and manage information related to horticultural systems. Students should be able to do that when they graduate from our department. Um, if Roberto says, my students are learning this in my course, and they're not, then that's a problem. Um, so we decided to evaluate it more in depth. So um, along with course alignment, how will this be advantageous to your course? So if you're implementing a project just to create more um, work, that's not very good. That's more work for you, more work for the students. Um, but really have a purpose uh, for it. So you know, again, that backwards design, you have your objectives. Um, how can this 
help your students learn more? How can this uh, work in your course? Um, you can use it to reinforce ideas, to facilitate more discussion, um, like you're doing in your course there, and to increase confidence. So that's one thing that we found our students, um, if they're going to be an extension agent and they have to talk to growers, they might not be very confident in their ideas. So this gives them a little bit more practice um, to share in sharing their ideas. Uh, so then manuscript identification. So what topics would you like to supplement? Um, check the syllabus. So Roberto was teaching the new course. Um, I went through the syllabus and said, OK, you're teaching about Easter lilies. We'll get a manuscript about Easter lilies. You're, this day you're discussing um, plant growth regulators, then we'll have a paper about plant growth regulators. Um, if there's a course that you have taught uh, multiple times before, you can identify weaknesses. You always know those topics that students are like, oh, they just, it doesn't click very well. And maybe there's a manuscript that um, can highlight the, you know, the, the process that you're looking at. And some of it, so some manuscripts might be like the newest information that's just out. Like, oh, we can manipulate growth this way by doing this, that just the paper published last year or something. Or it might be a pretty old manuscript that has some of that foundational information. Um, Sometimes, I was thinking about this, and sometimes um, you know, you're learning a new concept and you just assume everybody's known it forever, but it's, it gives you a different perspective when you read those foundational papers, and maybe that would help your students gain perspective um, on reading that as well. So just something to take into consideration. Um, yeah, what do your students struggle with in really uh, using this type of a project to uh, reinforce those ideas and help them through those problems. And then in our discipline, we basically have <laughs> um, three tiers in terms of, of journals. There's the one that's called the Journal of American Society of Horticultural Science, and that one's more fundamental, uh, basic research. So we don't typically tend to use those articles in, in, in these courses. They're two and 300 level. Then we have Hort Science, which is basically written for um, researchers. Um, and then we have Hort Technology, which is more for educators and the general public. So at, at least for the um, production course, Kelly focused on papers in Hort Science. And um, as we indicated in our um, learning outcomes, our, our department wants us to look at papers old as well as new. So papers that were 30 years ago, published 30 years ago up to 2017 is what we covered in. But we really tried to focus on the topics that we were uh, covering in, in the class. And with the structures class, I, I try to pick really relevant papers that, um, like Kelly mentioned, a, a new glazing material um, or a new method of irrigating crops. And students really like these topics because they're, they're new and exciting to the field. And, and we'll go into a little bit more about that a little later. Yeah, and make sure, like if you're um, a 100 versus a 400 level class or freshmen versus seniors, um, maybe your seniors have a, you know, a lot more experience with primary literature review, so you can pick some of those more difficult uh, manuscripts, give them a little bit of a challenge. Um, but ensure the message that you'd like to get across is clearly addressed by the paper. So when I was picking out manuscripts, um, I tried to pick out ones that were um, very straightforward and to the point. And one of them, the students had a bit of problems, a bit, quite a few problems with. Um, it was a paper on fertilizer concentrations. And there were some points that I thought were very clear and I wanted them to get, but then there was a lot of other information and they got bogged down by all that other information and that they didn't clearly get the points um, that I wanted them to get um, until we had our class discussion after this whole activity. Um, so I think going forward, that paper, we might switch it out for a different one that might be more to the point. Um, so they can really get the ideas. They, they did a great job of summarizing the paper. There was just so much information that it wasn't clear what I actually wanted them to learn. Um, and one tip I have, the course objectives and learning outcomes, do they match the research objectives of the manuscript? So I was, this was after the fact. Um, 
So one of the objectives of Roberto's course is to develop and implement greenhouse crop production schedules. So the students have to like schedule out when they're going to grow the crop and what they're going to do to you know, hit the market a certain date. I mean, poinsettias um, have almost no value after Christmas. So you have to be very careful about that. And that's the same with many other crops as well. Um, so one of the manuscripts was about um, how temperature affects perennial forcing time. And the objective in the manuscript was to quantify the effects of forcing temperature on time to flower and plant appearance of all these perennials uh, to provide crop production <laughs> scheduling data. So it matched clearly uh, with one of the objectives of the course. And it fit in well. Uh, finally, is the journal open access? So some of the main journals that we publish in um, are becoming open access. One's becoming open access next month. And we're kind of like, eh, the publishing fees are increasing. Uh, but it's good for our students. So if we're teaching our students how to use this type of literature, and we want them to continue using it once they go out into the industry, how do they have access to these journals? Um, I know, like Roberto was telling me earlier, sometimes he has master's students go into the industry, and all of a sudden they don't have access to the resources that they had while they were you know, here at Michigan State. Um, and what do, you, what do you do? So it's nice that some journals are becoming open access. And if you um, get the students familiar with open access journals, or if there are some good journals in your discipline that are open access, um, it's nice to use those. So then our audience. So who would be interested in this information? Now, this isn't just our students, right? Um, who else would be interested in the information from your uh, from your manuscript that you're reviewing. Um, obviously, other researchers, right? It's published. Um, they probably have peers. You may be interested in it yourself. Um, industry members. So a lot of the research uh, that we do is very applied. So a lot of people in the greenhouse industry are interested. Um, consumers. So if you're working, say, with <laughs> food crops or something, the consumers might be interested in that. Um, government. Uh, producers or growers in our case, um, or others. So there's a lot of people that could be interested in this type of research. And just keeping in mind um, who your students are going to be someday. What, what are they going to do after they leave your classroom? You know, is this going to pertain to them? So when they are going through this primary review uh, process, keeping the end audience in mind so is important. So for uh, the courses that I teach, have prim <coughs> primarily horticulture students, but I also have quite a few um, students that are in ag tech, which is a two-year program. And I'm sure those of you in, in uh, the College of Ag and Natural Resources know about the um, ag tech program. And, and oftentimes, uh, we do see you know, quite, quite a few differences between those students, where the, the four-year students, um, I would say, are, are definitely um, interested in, in the primary literature. And the ag tech, they tend to be a little shy. And so they, they need a little more hand-holding in terms of, um, you know, one thing I think was a, was a surprise to Kelly was uh, plagiarism. We, we basically had to, um, you know, have, have a talk with the class about that because uh, some of them didn't understand that, you, you know, when you write your summary, you can't take a chunk out of that paper and put it in and, and have it as your own. And, and they were, some of them were, what do you mean you can't do that? And, and it was actually a, a surprise to us that they, you know, were, Juniors, some of them, and, yeah, and didn't know this. Especially when I was a co-author on the manuscript, <laughs> and, but yeah, no, it's it's interesting what pops up and what conversations you have to have about primary primary literature or plagiarism or yeah, and I think it depends on you know who who's in your class, and it's important to know the makeup of your your class, which with with Roberto's classes is they're relatively small. His um, structures course that he teaches every fall has about 50 students, and the production course had 27. So teaching article analysis. Mm -hmm. So in terms of uh, the teaching article analysis is obviously um, have a lecture based on the topic that you're going to um, assign a, a lit literature on. So um, as, as Kelly mentioned, what we did with the production course is basically, you know, I'd, I'd have a, course, a lecture on, on Easter lily production. And then we would assign them a paper 
related to a particular topic on Easterly. So I believe it's a paper looking at how cold water affects um, stem elongation. So again, with Easter lilies, they have to be a certain height or Home Depot will not accept them. And so there was a scientist in um, Canada that found that if you pulled, put cold water on the plant every morning, the plant wouldn't grow as much. So the students thought that was really cool. Instead of using a chemical, which we typically use, um, you could use cold water. Um, so uh, we also showed them examples of secondary literature. So here's the primary, primary literature that was conducted at a university and then an extension bulletin was put together. So being able to interpret you know, the, the uh, scientific and then how it was written and, and um, written in a format that a greenhouse grower could interpret and utilize. Looking at the various components, so in the lecture that I'm giving on Thursday, it's, it's basically, you know, what is the, what's an abstract? You know, what information do you gather from an abstract? Um, you know, what, what are the numbers on that journal? What do they mean? Because a lot of students don't necessarily know, you know, the issue number, um, et cetera. Um, and then giving them examples of, of literature in your discipline or um, even talking about your, your own research. I, I tend to do that quite a bit in my courses is, is uh, show them how my re research is relevant to the industry and, and what they're going to do once they leave MSU. And then how to find uh, sources. So basically, if they're interested on a particular um, primary literature that they've read in, in class, going to the uh, references and seeing you know, what other papers are available and what resources they have here at MSU to be able to find both primary and secondary literature. Letting them know that Google Scholar is a thing. So that's, and I was just showing a, a new master's student how to look up his name to see all his old papers. I'm like, that's a good way um, to, to find sources. Um, and I want to say, like with this, um, Eugene Park uh, put together a great lecture. Uh, she TA'd Roberto's course uh, one year, and she put together a great lecture on introducing the students um, to uh, primary and secondary literature. So that's where I got some of the main bullet points from. <laughs> So making your expectations clear. Um, so you have, you have the lecture, but that it doesn't always you know, walk you through um, the paper. So providing a comprehensive rubric, um, we have found to be very um, beneficial. Yeah, and so um, if, if you'd like the rubric that we give, uh, just send me an email, and, and I'd be more than happy to share that with you. Um, basically, that rubric, I created it when I was at Purdue. And, and every course that I taught that I had primary literature, I, I basically modified that rubric, but students really like it because it, they know exactly what you're looking for. They know how many points um, they're going to get, and, uh, and then they can't argue with you. Well, why didn't I get points for this particular? It, it told you this is what you needed to write about. So, so these are some of the main questions uh, <coughs> that we have in the rubric that we thought would be um, applicable to almost any manuscript. So we, you know, even if you're I don't know about math. I don't know how the papers are generally structured, but in a lot of, um, I know a lot of different scientific and even the teaching uh, methods papers, um, you can kind of go through um, these questions. Where was the study conducted? Uh, what were the objectives? What was the control? That's something that I found students have issues with. What's the control? If it doesn't say this was the control, sometimes it's hard for them to pull it out. Yeah. Um, but it's a good you know, teaching moment. Um, or, or the objectives, if it doesn't clearly state these were the, the objectives. objectives, they have a very difficult time. But um, over the course, so we did this this past spring five times throughout the course. Um, I said, you have a week to write this paper. Um, come ask questions. So then I get emails or people stopping by my office. I cannot find the control. And they knew that last time I gave them a zero because they just skipped it, you know. But it's like try and you know ask questions. Um, general design of it, interpret a table or figure. So we let them pick a table or figure, and they have to interpret it um, fully. They have to explain to us what it what it means. And we give them, you know, we go over the whole rubric and help explain to them, you know, like what each part means. Um, a couple of examples that, of questions that we put in um, that's just specific to our discipline. Um, what plant material was used? They need to write the common name, the scientific name, um, and the cultivar name, and they need to write it properly because that's very important. Um, <clears throat> what segments of the, we usually put green industry, uh, will this research be applicable to? And this um, is so something they, they struggle, sometimes they'll, they'll struggle with because 
um, you know, we basically want them to tell us how can a greenhouse grower utilize this information. And you know, it, it, it seems like a relatively easy thing because usually at the end of the paper there's a conclusion and uh, usually tells you, but sometimes they, they do struggle with this, this part of the analysis. So uh, moving on to student learning, um, there's a few ways uh, that a few ways that you can implement projects. Uh, we use a paper summary, so we have the students write everything. Um, but I was thinking of a different methods that you could use um, when you have a primary literature project, maybe a class presentation. So you still you could use that same or a similar rubric and have the students present, you know, individually or in a group. Um, we also have exam questions. So uh, Roberto a lot of times has um, questions like, oh, you're a greenhouse grower, like what would you do? And it's based, it's based off of what was in the paper, but they also have to take into consideration what they learned in the class. Um, and then maybe a video or other non-traditional methods. Um, what methods do you guys use when you're implementing primary literature? Do you guys have any project or do you just say read it or? Writing. Hey. In, in that same course, I had um, they had to uh, develop a proposal for picking a new species at a zoo or aquarium, and so they had to design their uh, animal husbandry plan, their exhibit design, things of that nature, and it had to be based upon primary research. Okay, so their whole project had to be based off of primary primary research. That's and then the other thing that we don't have up here that we have is also a discussion in class. So we discuss every paper in class for about half the class and uh, um, yeah, they, they seem to really enjoy the, uh, that component. Um, another thing that I have done, that, and I really enjoy this as well, is if it's a topic that I really know the students are interested in, I'll ask the um, authors of that paper if they would join us via Skype. And so then the students can basically ask them more in-depth questions that maybe I can't necessarily answer. And the students really like that, uh, and, and the authors really enjoy it. So. Um, that's, that's an idea as well for you to, to think about. So again, so we're talking about um, the content knowledge and making sure they're accountable for content knowledge through a paper summary or something. Um, but we're just focusing on remembering mainly for that. But if you use primary literature for a project where they have to create something, um, that's what our, our goal is, right? Um, so <clears throat> we focused on creating recommendations. So we really wanted them, you know, we identified the audience who this paper pertained to, and we wanted them to create a recommendation, uh, in our case, for a greenhouse grower. Um, and this may not be always intuitive, right? Um, so how do we guide the students in providing information to this target audience? Um, we asked a question, uh, what is the practical significance of this paper to the industry. And then we gave them a description, um, you know, make it provide a recommendation as if you were talking to a greenhouse grower. And I said, make sure that you have a complete recommendation taking this paper and what you learned in class. So say Roberto already taught about Easter lilies, then we have the manuscript. So you have to take this manuscript and what he taught in class into consideration. It has to be accurate. You can't just, um, sometimes you have students with these weird ideas that is not based in science at all and they want to put that into their recommendation, but that's not accurate. Um, so their recommendation has to be accurate and it has to be practical. If you're growing that Easter lily or poinsettia and the fastest way to grow it costs $1,000, you're not going to be able to sell that for $1,000, so that recommendation is not practical. Um, and then uh, the language that they used. So the students had to make sure that um, what they were saying was in a way that they would talk to a grower, not necessarily how the paper was written. And they didn't seem to have a problem with this, but we'll go over that more um, later. So again, accuracy, completeness, language used, and practicality. So that's what we determined were um, important in the recommendation. And we had a rubric um, to grade the recommendations off of um, these four areas. And as I was thinking about it more, so it was a, you know, zero, one, or two points uh, for each of these. Um, and I think all of them are important, 
Uh, but I was thinking more about this, and I think completeness is one thing that I think could have you know, been given more points. Just making sure that they're very thorough in taking all aspects of the study and what was learned in class into consideration. Um, but then, again, follow up. So they turn in their paper and they're done, right? Check the box. Uh, but giving individual follow up through um, grading the assignment. Um, I tried to have the papers graded within a week um, and give that back to them and give them feedback on all parts like this is the control so they can look back or give them recommendations on how to improve their recommendation. So um, I remember the first time I graded them, you know, the scores were not the greatest because I think they were just checking off boxes on the rubric and I really wanted them to think about it. And they were like, why was my score so low? And I'm like, did you actually think about what you were writing? And most of them hadn't thought about it too much. So in the future, then they, they tended to focus on that a bit more. Um, and then immediate. So you turn in the paper and you wait a week, you forget a lot of things, right? Because you might have written the paper the night before. If you go to class, it's fresh in your mind. Um, I know that's what I usually do. And I think a lot of students do that as well. But and, and I think um, I'm going to bring up an example here that I, that I just thought of. So I had a, a student who, <laughs> uh, this past spring who did not like doing the uh, primary literature, the whole, the whole process. But he wanted to go to grad school. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, when you go to grad school, I, I don't think he really knew what grad school was, was all about. I said, you're going to have to read a lot of papers in grad school. And you're going to have to write about them. You're going to have to write your own. And he looked at me and he said, I don't think I want to go to grad school. So I think it it's also opens up their eyes in terms of you know, what's, what's beyond uh, the career goal you know, that, that they're interested in. So I actually have to leave. I, I teach at 1240. But um, Kelly, is, is, uh, the, the, the best is, is yet to come. She's going to give, basically give you the results of, of her research. And uh, I think they're really quite interesting. So if, if you have any questions, like I said, please send me an email if you'd like the rubric. So Does anybody you. have any quick questions right now before Roberto leaves? Like, if you care. All right, thank you. Yeah, so then immediate feedback. Um, as Roberto mentioned earlier, uh, we have a classroom discussion. So they come into class and they turn in the paper, and then we have a discussion about what they just read and the paper that they just wrote. Um, so usually, you know, I have my ideas are what, on what's important and what I want them to get out of the paper. Um, so I, you know, write bullet points up on the board on topics I want them to talk about, and we do a think-pair-share. So, you know, generally smaller classes, but it works pretty well. Um, they're talking about it, and I go around the room and, you know, pick out people that I know can have a good explanation. Um, and then we come back together and discuss each of the topics. And when I go to the results a little bit more, I'm only going to be sharing a couple couple questions, but one of them, you know, I really noticed that the students weren't getting this one, you know, this one area. And I wouldn't have known until I graded um, the papers, but instead I knew right away because no one in the class was talking about this, this one topic. Um, and then Roberto mentioned a video uh, question and answer session with authors. So being researchers, we have a lot of colleagues um, that do research in our, in our area. And the students loved this. They loved having um, you know, the authors up on the screen. And the one, that was, um, the, the one that we usually do every year is about soil moisture sensors. And this was a completely new concept to them. And it's a newer concept um, that's being implemented in all sorts of horticultural settings. And so the students were really interested. And the authors were excited that people were excited in their research. So I think it was. Um, beneficial to everyone involved. And I think we want to do more of this in the future. But it's something to keep in mind. So um, then we'll, we'll talk transition into talking about what we did in our specific research project and how we set it up. Um, yeah, I think our results were pretty cool. And you can use this, if you'd like, as a springboard to implement um, different teaching research in your classroom. So again, improving critical thinking and writing through scientific literature review. And I have the flowers here because, again, this was in the floriculture production course. Um, our objective was to increase students' ability and perceived confidence um, in critically analyzing primary literature, 
formulating practical recommendations based on what they read um, and communicating those to an industry layperson. We thought um, that this uh, reading a series of primary literature uh, articles and writing summary papers uh, would increase their ability and not only their ability but their confidence um, in analyzing and critiquing primary literature, formulating practical recommendations, and communicating those recommendations to an industry layperson. Um, and again, we have our seven main steps um, to implementing primary um, literature. So you can kind of think of these as I'm going through, through the study. Uh, first, what is the course? Again, floriculture production, a 300 level course. We had 27 students. Um, most of them were juniors, uh, but we had some seniors, some sophomores, egg, and egg tech uh, students as well. And most of them have reviewed primary literature in a previous course. Um, but again, what we found is, you know, do they actually know how to do it effectively? Uh, so we had to go over that again. Um, and then we asked them, you know, have they worked in a greenhouse before? Because it's nice if they've worked in a greenhouse before, they can make those connections more easily. And about half of our students had worked in a greenhouse in some sort of capacity. Um, we selected five different topics again, um, irrigation water and easter lily height control, uh, forcing temperature on perennial scheduling, um, <clears throat> comparing high pressure sodium and LED lamps. This is one of the new topics that students uh, were interested in. Uh, fertilizer concentration um, and plant growth regulators. So again, each of these uh, manuscripts, I, they all happen to be from the same journal, but I didn't plan that. I was looking uh, for articles that complemented the syllabus and that were short and to the point, and they all happen to be from the same journal. And that, might, that may or may not happen in your discipline as well. But now in the future, I know that this is a good journal to go to uh, to find articles for, for the paper, or for the class. Um, <coughs> how we set this up? Uh, we had a pre-survey, and then after they took the survey in class, um, I would post the article on D2L. And they had a week to write a summary paper, and then it was due in class. And at that class, they turned in the paper, and then they took a post-survey. And we did this five times uh, over the course of the semester. So we'll focus on you know, one paper unit. So basically, there were two parts, a survey and a summary paper. And if we break down the survey, the first part was a self-assessment of their general ability. So this was three questions, and it was the same on all the surveys throughout the course of the semester. Um, one of the questions, uh, for example, was, I can read, uh, summarize, and comprehend uh, primary literature. And they would say how much they agreed uh, based on a Likert scale. Then the second part was a self-assessment of their content knowledge. Uh, for example, um, I, know how, um, I know how to apply cold water to control the height of Easter lilies. And so they'll say how much they agree to that. But then uh, we would have a content knowledge assessment. So this is kind of like the quiz part, right? So we actually ask them a question that corresponds with um, the self-assessment content knowledge question. So um, they'd have to explain how to apply the water, or they'd have to explain how they would change the temperature to get a desired result. So, <clears throat> so that was the makeup of each survey. And the content knowledge ones, um, it was just, it was specific to the paper. So each paper had different content knowledge questions. And again, each self-assessment question had a corresponding um, knowledge assessment question. And then we had our summary paper. And uh, we, the part that I analyzed was the part that focused on applying the content knowledge. So yeah, we graded um, whether they knew what the control was. But I didn't use that in the study. I focused on their recommendation. 
So they're really the application um, of their knowledge. So what did we find? Um, for the one question, I can read, comprehend, and summarize primary literature on new research. Uh, we found that their confidence decreased over time, um, which I was surprised. But when you, and I wasn't as familiar with, with teaching literature, right? Um, but the more you know, the more you realize that you don't know, right? And so as the semester progressed, uh, their confidence decreased. But um, when we look at the actual content knowledge, um, we have more promising uh, results. So for their self-assessment, um, <clears throat> so the green is pre, yellow is post. Um, we'll focus on this question right here, because there was a lot of questions, right? Um, I can explain the relationship between average daily temperature and perennial flower number. So, you know, a three is, is pretty good, so they think they can do this, right? Um, but their, their confidence in, in their ability to do this increased. Um, if we look at what they actually knew, um, pre, um, not as much, but their, their, their knowledge increased, so they were learning. We asked them, uh, when forcing perennials, as you increase the temperature from 15 to 24 C, uh, what generally happens to the number of flowers? So they had to explain what happens. Um, and you can see about 20% got correct on the, uh, the pre-survey, and about 90% got the answer correct on the post-survey. So they were learning, right? So that's good, and that's what happens when we do. So when we conduct primary literature reviews, this is what we hope happens, right? We want to teach them our content knowledge and what we want to get across in the class. Um, another question, I know how light quantity and quality influence plant growth. So um, they think they know this. And then when we ask them, in supplemental lighting applications, does light quantity or light quality have a larger impact on growth? And uh, most of them got it wrong at first. And then you can see it was below 60% got it right um, in the post survey. And this became apparent when we were having our class discussion. Um, so, and this is a new thing that was coming up with LED lighting. So a lot of their, our teaching greenhouses, we switched over to LED lights. We had all high pressure sodium lights. And they think that LED lights, you know, having them as supplemental lighting in a greenhouse makes everything grow better. And that's not true. And there's research published that's saying, you know, with supplemental lighting applications, um, they're just as good. They work the same. Um, but students still didn't get that after reading this paper, even though that was like the title of the paper. <laughs> so we had a class discussion about it. And I think if we did another um, survey maybe a week after, this would have increased. Because I think having that conversation and really debunking those myths, just reading the paper wasn't enough um, to really get that idea across. Um, and then when they were writing their recommendation, again, we had the four different areas uh, that we graded. Um, so we looked at accuracy, uh, completeness, practicality, and the language used. So in general, uh, their, the quality of their recommendations increased as the semester progressed. Um, the language used, they were pretty good the entire time. Um, maybe that's because they were not researchers and they weren't in that research mindset where they have to make everything overly science-y. Um, but how they presented the information was, uh, was good. So one question that I get when I was talking about this is, <laughs> what happened here? Um, Roberto decided that they could drop one from their scores. So we only had nine people uh, finish and maybe they didn't put in all the effort that they, that they could have or maybe only the students who did poorly before um, completed that last one. But in general, um, the quality of their recommendations increased, which was exciting. Even though their confidence increased, their actual abilities were better. So in conclusion, uh, students' perceptions of their ability uh, decreased, of their ability to read and comprehend. Um, but their perceived confidence in their content knowledge um, generally increased, as well as their with their confidence, um, or with their actual content knowledge. Um, and then their ability to provide recommendations increased. So 
that was exciting that that actually happened. I was I was nervous when we started out. Like, are they actually going to improve? And we were very excited when their recommendations did Im improve. Um, and what are the implications? Um, their perceptions of their abilities may not be an accurate measurement of their abilities. So we saw that um, their abilities, you know, increased while their confidence decreased. Um, <clears throat> and back to this one. So, and I was thinking about this with our departmental learning outcomes. So they're taking this survey before they're graduating about their ability to meet these different areas. And if they're Based on this, their, their abilities are increasing, but their confidence is decreasing. So when they're taking the survey, it's at the, when they're graduating, it's basically a survey of their confidence and they're in their ability to do different things. So maybe that's not the best way that we should be um, assessing the, our departmental learning outcomes. Um, this primary literature project is an effective way to increase the content knowledge, uh, which is what we want in our classes, right? Um, and their confidence in their content knowledge. And then, again, similar projects may be implemented to address other student learning outcomes. Um, we're all scientists, we can, we can um, implement new projects. Um, and the student's ability to critically analyze and provide recommendations improved, uh, which was um, one of the main things that I wanted to happen in this project. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to thank these people and organizations. And are there any questions? Yeah. Um, sorry, I might have missed. Oh, oh. This, one. this one. Okay, I'll give that to Kelly. Yeah, great. Sorry, I was a little bit late because I was teaching. I might have missed this, but okay. uh, did you have a control where you analyze the same kind of progression in a more traditional class versus with primary literature? So we did not have a control. And that's one thing that, so when I was setting up this experiment, it's, it's a rather small class and it's only taught every other year. I'm like, oh no, I'm not gonna have a control. I don't know what to do. And um, my, my FAST community said, why don't you just do repeated measures and see how it works over the semester. So that's what we did. We did not have a class, though, where we did not implement um, this project. So yeah. Other yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> do you have any recommendations for um, implementing this kind of thing in a larger classroom where grading at that level is not possible? Um, so in a larger classroom, I, I don't know because I don't really have experiment, experience in a larger classroom. Um, but I think maybe if you had peers critique each other's, um, each other's recommendations, um, that might be an effective way to, to do this. Yeah. Some, some peer review maybe. Yeah, so, and then a class discussion to, to build off of that in peer review. Yeah. It sounds like an idea for another workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just to add to that, uh, for a larger classroom, I don't know if any of y'all have used uh, calibrated peer review. It's a tool by, um, I think it's from UCLA, and you give essentially two calibrated graded essays to calibrate the students' abilities and then they grade each other's. It's awesome. Oh, I've never heard of that before. That's Other questions or comments? I'll make a comment. I think that um, you mentioned the, um, the idea that the students' perceptions of their abilities to read papers um, uh, that you found in the literature that that's consistent with other things and I, and I just wanted to reiterate that point I think that um, what this is about is really metacognition right and their understanding of whether or not they can do something and that kind of data is very common in the literature and so I think when you see the data go down like that sometimes we think it's a failure but I think it's actually a success that they became more aware of their shortcomings as it relates to reading the literature Anything else? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Kelly. We appreciate it. Thanks.